It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to live from my drum room today. And uh, Dave Weckl, who was my 100th episode a couple of weeks ago, um, was honored to have Dave as my 100th guest. And at the end of the show, he said to me, I said, I couldn't get to all the questions. And Dave was kind enough to say, why don't I come back and do a Q&A? So that's where we are today. And I so appreciate his generosity in giving up his time today to do that. So please welcome the great Dave Weckl, who you can see in your screen and who will be joining me in just a second. Sorry, and man. There. I, 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 had to, I had to hit a bunch of okay, I got it buttons that I, <laughs> there that I had to hit. So. Uh, no problem. Here we are. No problem. Yes. Thank you for being here, Dave. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. How's it going, everybody? Let's uh, hope everybody's good. I think everybody's great. We've got lots and lots of folks watching. So um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get to the questions, Dave, that people sent in advance. The well, folks before that, we do, yes, I have to mention the shirt, Johnny. The shirt, <laughs> the shirt is awesome, man. That one. <laughs> That's great. Well, when we're uh, when we're done, text me your your home address. I, I know a guy. Yeah, I'm sure you do. You know a lot of guys. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, Whew, that brings back some memories. Yeah, yeah, me too, buddy. Me too. I know we were, well, we're the same age, so we grew up, like you yeah. said, you know, coming home from school, and I'd watch Speed Racer cartoons on TV. Yep. Yep. I think the difference, though, was probably at a point, you then went and practiced your drums and became Dave Weckl, and I continued to watch Speed Racer and became <laughs> who I am. <laughs> come on now, come on now. <laughs> I think that's probably, you know, you probably went, yeah, okay, I've seen enough Speed Racer, I got to go, you know. I, I see stuff. drum sets, I see drum sets back there, Johnny, not not TV screens, so you're good, man. You're good, you're Thank out you. there playing, it's great. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, absolutely, yeah. All right, well, man, this is great. I Not surprisingly, Dave, we've got a great turnout here for the Q&A, and I was just telling everybody, that you were kind enough. Uh, I think it was when we were off the air when you did the 100th episode. And I said, man, you know, I couldn't get to all the questions. And you said, well, I'll just do another another show, just a Q&A. So really appreciate you doing this today. This is great. No problem. My pleasure. And hope, uh, hope everybody, like I said, hope everybody's good. My wife always tells me I talk too much. So, you know, that was the problem. I just kept talking. And, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I hope we get Let's get to it. Let's go. Hopefully, right, let's get to it. Okay. So first question comes from Benedict Stefan. Um, and his question is, Dave, could you please talk a little bit about how the recording of Rhythm of the Soul album went down? Where the recording, where did the recording take place and what snare drum was used on Mud Sauce? <laughs> okay, Benedict. So you're, uh, you have to realize you're wanting me to recall 26 years ago. I know that because this was done right when my daughter Claire was uh, was born, and uh, so probably yeah, to 27 years ago. So because <clears throat> she's 25 now, so a couple of years before that. Well, Jay Oliver and I, uh, I had decided that I wanted to stop doing project records, and I wanted to meaning that we weren't writing for a band. We were just writing like, oh, let's do this style. Oh, let's do this thing. Let's invite these guys. Let's have this type of band uh, type of situation. So it was project recordings. Uh, Rhythm of the Soul was really the first recording that we uh, that we did that was really written for a band. We weren't exactly sure who was going to be in the band yet, but the idea of the style of the music um, and uh, I knew I knew I wanted Buzz Featon <laughs> on guitar, um, yeah. and we had, a, we had a few different sax players I think on the, on that record. But it was all done in my garage in uh, in California in Chatsworth when I when I was there at that period of time, and it was a very small studio. Um, I remember though, uh, and might have been our first recording with digital recordings um, because we were using ADATs before then. Uh, so um, the, the timeline, I can't really remember uh, at this point, the, f the media or the format of the recording uh, apparatus. But uh, I know that I was in a, a corner, kind of a booth made uh, made by 
divided the control room and the drum booth with homemade gobos that were in between the control room. And um, a couple things about that record that I do remember is that the bass drum, um, I didn't have a hole in the head. I wanted to have, um, you know, the full sounding bass drum. And for that music, it was a little bit of a challenge, but I did have an internal mic and an external mic. Um, and the other thing that I was using on that recording, I remember, was a stereo, a sure stereo mic out in front of the drums. So a lot of that drum sound was a combination of, um, you know, I did have a, a few feet in front of the drums, so uh, I was able to put that mic there. So got, um, you know, a good representation of the drum kit, you know, stereo right in front of it, and then I blended in, of course, the individual mics, which, which were sure SM98s, which is, I'm pretty sure, which is still what I'm using today, actually. Uh, the old, the old original capsules, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, we wrote and recorded it all there. We had a, a guitar, we did overdubs, we didn't, we couldn't do anything live, it really wasn't set up to do that. So it was a layered record, meaning everybody recorded separately. Um, I remember we had Buzz feet and over and we had a, a, a guitar uh, amp case built to go out in the, the small third car garage so we could actually mic the amplifier without disturbing the neighbors. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, that's um, hopefully that answers the question. It was start to finish in, in that small two car garage, um, you know, and I forget where it was mastered. We didn't master it, but we mixed it. So I, and um, yeah, I just can't remember if it was if it was all digital or, or still analog at that point. And the snare drum on on uh, did you? Sorry, if you if you answered that, I was reading some of these. No, questions. I didn't. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, I'd have to. I'd I'd really have to lie, but I'm gonna guess that it was the aluminum five and a half by fourteen, my signature snare with Yamaha. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to guess, because I'm pretty sure at that period of time I was exclusively using that drum. I would I would bet that that's what it was, then, if that's what you recall. Yep. Thanks, Dave. That's great. Thank you so much. It's a great answer. And next question is from my old friend, Anthony Cusina, who's I think hasn't missed one of these shows. Mm -hmm. Not surprising. He got a question in early and he said, Hi, John, would you please ask Dave to share some of his main takeaways that helped him change his approach to the kit? after studying with Freddie Gruber? Well, uh, Freddie, uh, God rest his soul. He was such a great character. Um, there's a number of us that uh, spent time with Freddie and benefited from his, uh, his, um, his wisdom. And, uh, you know, I was uh, living in LA at the time. And so I, I, I was able, uh, kind of based on Steve Smith's recommendation, really. Um, Cause I just, I saw Steve just like, leaps and bounds getting better. I'm like, man, what are you doing? And he said, you got to go see Freddie now. Was, <laughs> okay, I was kind of shot away from Freddie because he was uh, a little bit of a character. And it's, it, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Long story short, I ended up studying with Freddie. And, um, you know, the biggest things that I took away from it really were um, how important... Um, well, I guess I should start with what he gave me, which was really the the uh, everything having to do with natural with that word, natural body motion, the natural laws of physics concerning the drumsticks when they bounce. There's that's the action. You go to the head; it's an action. The, the reaction is a, is a is the rebound. And it was all a, a difference and kind of more of an awareness, not a difference, because I was doing it sometimes. In his words, he came to see me play before I started studying. And he um, he said after the show, he says, you know, you're in the zone some of the times. I can get you there all the time. So I said, OK. And um, his definition of the zone was basically being in that place where I think Buddy Rich said it best. He said, you know, it's, a, you know, um, it's almost like you're watching yourself play. You're not actually doing it. Um, so the whole physical event, uh, you know, of of playing the drums becomes less physical of course now this is you know me with the style of music that i play most most of the time which um you know which is which is jazz oriented there are times that um you know that i will play a little heavier for fusion and the occasional uh, 
funk pop type of situation that I might be in. Um, like we just posted, do I do? We just we just did the Stevie tune that's been out now for a few days, and getting a co- lot of comments on that on that uh, on that yeah. hosting of, of like, wow, I've never heard you play two and four before. Wow, it's great to hear you play Grace. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> a lot of what I like to do. I just don't get much opportunity to do it, so I'm going to be doing more of it actually. But um, but yeah, a lot of so in in a heavier situation, even with that. Um, if you're approaching it, how Freddie was was talking about with this, uh, with the laws of physics in play, meaning action, reaction, so that you know bouncing a stick, bouncing the stick is like bouncing a ball, and it, it uh, even if you're playing softer, controlled strokes, um, you know they're 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 still they're still bouncing, and it's really about manipulation, balance. I took that away too of just being balanced. That's why I actually designed these evolution uh, second model of my signature stick because the first ones the red ones were longer and they weren't as heavy up here so the bounce wasn't working in a balanced position um, so when I when I took all that away I mean just a lot of things happened um, first of all body fatigue went away um, I wasn't having to tape up fingers anymore I was in less pain um, I was, um, you know, able to do things uh, with less physical effort, and I was able to um, get this, get a bigger sound out of the drums as well. Uh, and uh, so that then then kind of, um, in order for all of that to happen, the one thing that I figured out for myself, not so much a takeaway, because Freddie really wasn't playing; he wasn't sitting at the kit, so the kit. And the ergonomics of the kit became less of a, you know, or it wasn't something that he was thinking about, but it certainly forced me to think about it. So I sort of tore down my kit at the time. I think I was playing three rack toms across the top here, eight, 10, 12. And I took them down and just started over. It really started thinking, you know, about how, you know, especially with traditional grip. I, I spent a good amount of time in the early 90s kind of going, uh, spending a good amount of time developing match grip more and playing that way a lot more. I had percussion over here. I was doing a lot of different stuff. So, uh, and I was playing heavier gigs too. Um, Brecker Brothers, for example, I did a tour with them and I remember playing that gig, mostly match grip. So, uh, so there was that period of time that I developed it. Um, but I decided, you know, that, and uh, a lot of people have kind of said this too, Thomas Lang being one of them, it's, uh, it's really difficult to maintain both grips. I mean, there's just not enough time in a day. Yeah. So I made a decision to just go back to home base for me, which is traditional. And, uh, and then I just started thinking about Freddie's thing about natural, you know, natural body movement, um, stopping the stroke when it stops. So in that sense, then I wanted to set up the drums where the stroke naturally stops, not to keep going, not to keep reaching. Um, so those were big takeaways. And by the way, um, little sales pitch here, of course, um, all of yeah, this yeah. stuff I'm talking about is, uh, is the tip of a very big iceberg in my online school that I go into in detail. Um, uh, a lot of different stuff. Technique is just one of uh, a, a one hour or so or of the 60 or so that we have up there. So there's a lot of information there. You can go to my website, daveweichel.com and check that out. 30 bucks a month. Get a lot of demos, a lot of de- demonstrations, really in depth about all this stuff. So get that out of the way now. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for but that. was it. That was it. Really kind of just, you know, um, you know, changing my, uh, not changing, but being aware of the difference between, you know, the middle finger and the thumb being the grip and the fulcrum point versus the front. And that's a huge difference. So, um, you know, from back here, it, 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 it's a little bit old school, but, you know, for me, it's the most common sense is that all five fingers are on a stick at once uh, versus if you're a front of the hand priority with index finger and thumb, it tends to pull the back of the hand off the stick. And so you see a lot of guys play like this, you know, where that back of the hand is off. And, you know, just from a common sense stand, uh, standpoint, for me, this doesn't make any sense. It's 20% of your hands versus having all the fingers in, on there for, for different controls, fingers, you know, whatever you might use. But even, like I said, soft, you know, very soft controlled strokes that these the fingers don't ever leave the stick. 
and the gap stays. I mean, that's the that's the biggest clue for if you're playing front priority or back of the hand. Or fingers, back fingers. Yeah. So that's that's kind of it for the Freddy thing. And, that's great. Um, Can so I just ask you just I to just wish, I just wish I would have gotten with him about 20 years earlier. That's the only thing. <laughs> I think it all worked out. I was just to, to pivot off that. I I want to ask you, did you find during that period you were playing match grip? And I remember that period too, where you kind of went, you you were using both grips for a while. Did you did you notice? And I think I know the answer to this. Um, a difference in the, in the way that um, maybe you didn't have as much, maybe not control, but um, uh, not that your technique suffered. But did you find it easier to do things with traditional grip because you've been playing that long, so long that way? Then when you switched to match, you couldn't do things as as uh, with this, with the same ease you could do? Well, I think I know the, maybe the word you're looking for, at least the one that, that comes to mind when you, when you start talking about the difference between matched and traditional. The biggest difference for me, you know, when I, to answer your question, the thing I could actually do some things easier with match grip because the kit was set up for that, mm -hmm. uh, which is powerful Tom Tom stuff, especially singles, you know, um, and in fact, even today, if I have to play Tom Tom oriented grooves or solos or uh, heavier stuff, I'm not going to mess around with with this because it's just going to damage my thumb and I'm going to have to overplay to do it. And sometimes it's just not even even with the positioning of my rack toms when I play my bigger kit where my 10 is kind of up here and the 12 goes down this way. So I get that power. A lot of the times I'll just still turn it over this way. So there are, of course, advantages to uh, to play and match when you're talking about power situations. The, the biggest thing, though, for me that is lacking or I miss with, with match grip versus traditional is the touch and the sonic contrast. Um, I can't I can't touch things the same, mainly because it's harder to get on the tip. OK. And matched, I'm, I'm always, you know, you're always in this position. To go up here is kind of unnatural. And, and I'm talking about ghost note type of things, you know, if you're. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Playing this type of thing. You know, I can go up there versus. It, the, the match grip thing tends to, to sound a little bit more monosonic, is the word I use, the term mm -hmm. I created maybe. With, with traditional, it's easier to get up on that tip. So, you know, especially if you're playing, you know. Yeah, if you're playing the jazz stuff, there's, for me, no contest. It's the touch yeah. Yeah. that is, that is um, kind of more naturally, there's the word again, um, you know, it's natural. I'm more naturally able to do it um, traditional. Uh, and, you know, for me, I mean, I've been playing, I don't, I don't know how many years now, but 50 something, you know, and a long time. And I, I started this way. I grew up that way. All my favorite players were playing that way in, back in the day. So, you know, it's so I, that's how I learned. So it's home. The muscle memory is so, you know, implanted in, in the RAM, you know, that it's motor skills at this point are never going to learn matched as comfortably, you know, as this is already, you know, ingrained. In the, in the in the ram makes that makes perfect sense okay thank you dave so next question is from todd cummings and he says hi john my question for dave is about his time in connecticut connecticut has been part of the origins origin story of an important stop on the journey for a surprising number of musicians and i was wondering if dave had a fond or funny memory about his time in connecticut he could share yeah, if I have any memory of Connecticut, it's going to be you know, a miracle because, again, that, <laughs> that was seemingly four lifetimes ago. Um, yeah, a long time ago. I, I was in Connecticut from, um, let's see, the, well, right about the beginning of 1979, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and I was, I, I actually moved, I actually moved down into New York. Um, a couple of years after that, so not city, but I was in I was in Pelham, Mount Vernon, New, New Rochelle, in that area, um, and I left completely. So uh, in 91, 90, 91, So I was I was on the East Coast for eleven years, um, and 
um, you know, funny, funny stuff. I, and, um, no, I just remember, you know, it, I mean, fun stuff, you know, going through college, University of Bridgeport with Joel Rosenblatt, another you know, great, great drummer friend that um, we roomed together. We, you know, we were kind of always battling and competing and not only drums, but racquetball and like anything else, you know, it was not <laughs> competition. Um, and, um, you know, just a, lo a lot of fun times with the jazz band there, with the band Night Sprite that was created, um, you know, in Connecticut, which, you know, was a tremendous band with um, Andy Block and Paul Adamy and, and uh, Fred Vigdor, who ironically just moved to St. Louis too, which is a funny, Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and um, Brendan O'Keefe was the original keyboard player. Then Jay, I got Jay Oliver in the band. And then Daniel Linsky got in there. And we had always had female vocalists. You know, um, and so that band was was so instrumental, no pun intended, in, in kind of, you know, getting my career happening. Um, and not only that, I mean, the, the jazz band, the jazz ensemble at Bridgeport University in Connecticut, where I went for a year and a half, um, Neil Slater, you know, again, Paul Adamy was in that band, as, as was Fred. And uh, so we, we had a lot of great moments. I was in the Sonny Costanzo big band as well, and traveled with Sonny to Prague, Czechoslovakia. A lot of, a lot of things happened in that area. Yeah. in Connecticut in, in those early years. And then, like I said, I moved closer to New York and then I started to get into the New York scene um, by the time I was 22. Mm -hmm. So, Is that when you studied with Gary Chester? Was it when you moved to New York? That's, no, that's, a, well, it was kind oh, of right. right. It was right in the middle of all that because Gary lived uh, in uh, across the Tappan Zoo Bridge. I forget the exact city, but... But yeah, I, I remember that I was 22 when I studied with him. So it was kind of in that in that period. I remember though I was living in, now I remember because I was actually living in New York on, in, above this apartment, uh, this apartment above an old abandoned pizzeria. And it was a mess, God. I just remember <laughs> having my, my drum set set up with towels in it. So it would make a lot of noise. And I remember studying Freddie, uh, Gary's stuff, getting so frustrated that I was winging drumsticks across the, across the room. <laughs> into the wall because I was so pissed because I couldn't I just couldn't get it his oh, stuff was funny. so hard you know the new breed stuff before it was new breed um yeah so that was in that period um also Jay Prince um got into his band with Frank Byer and Dom Chiquetti and um you know we we had a we had a great time oh I failed to mention Joe Bonadio and percussion with Night oh, yeah. Spark. so yeah just a lot of guys a lot of you know, connections and, and, um, you know, Vinice Thomas and Janice Dempsey were the singers, by the way, in, in Night Spread. And, uh, boy, we had some, I, it was definitely a fun time, but man, we, we worked our butt off. I remember Jay and I, when we started to get gigs in New York city, we, we carried, we used to, we used to carry our own PA, meaning speakers, everything. And I remember Jay and I by ourselves lifting all that stuff up the stairs at Seventh Avenue South down down in the village to play a gig. But that that was the gig that Peter Erskine came to, yeah, and, yeah. Wrote and recommended me for a bunch of stuff. So it it's the whole thing. You never hard work pays off. I've always believed in that. And you know, the harder you work for stuff, it, you know it, it you know you get you get something out of it. You get something in return. So you know that was. Uh, I think we made 25 bucks that night a piece. And um, I was probably like sore for two weeks and uh, <laughs> got me the gig with French toast. Thanks to Peter. Yeah, man. That's what a scene it was too, by the way. I, I've heard you talk about it too. Another, other times, you know, just a, a great time to be there, you know, with all those oh, other was, great players. And, oh, yeah. it was awesome. I, yeah. you know, 79 was the first time I got to see Steve Gadd play at that same club, 7th Avenue South, which was the Brecker Brothers Club. They owned it at the time. And um, that was the first time I saw Steve. It was the first time I got to see Steve Jordan. Like everybody in New York was playing out. So, you know, before I started to actually play out heavily with the cats, you know, it was like I was going to see everybody and hang out.
you know, Peter was playing in New York too. You know, so, um, yes. great, great times, great memories. Great times, yeah. So this this next question, thank you for that, Dave. This qu question comes from Giovanni Satoni. Satani, Satoni, and um, I, I asked him to clarify. He may not have got my message, but his question is uh, about your sticks, about Dave's sticks. I have a pair or two, and I'm interested in your preference for the weight, especially of the sticks, and what you prefer. I well, guess dis describing what? personal preference, but I, yeah, I don't know if he means your personal big first stick or just in general. I don't know, but. Well, I'm not going to get into exact numbers, but I will say that, that uh, you know, my stick, I, I asked for the lighter versions of this. So, you know, because obviously wood, wood is, is you know, there's yeah. a big variance in, in wood from naturally. Uh, and it changes from, you know, creation to shipping to where it goes. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of variables there. But, but, um, but I prefer, you know, the, the, the second version of my stick has more weight up here. The problem with putting more weight up here is that they generally ship a little heavier for my taste overall. But, but I'm a small guy, so I my hands are small, and you know I've got I've got some arthritis and stuff that I'm dealing with. So anything too heavy, I I really hypersensitive to that, and I I feel it right away. I start hurting, so fatiguing. So I prefer the lighter versions of the SD2 Evolution Stick. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. All right. This comes from my old buddy, Mike Rogello. Uh, and he's asking, are brushes still a requirement on some gigs? This past summer, I had a young drummer ask me what those soft stick things were <laughs> <laughs> that I was scraping around the head. <laughs> you know, it, it amazes me that, um, you know, that, uh, well, I guess it's all a journey, right? We were all unaware of everything at one point, but you know, uh, with Luft, with YouTube, and you know, it's God. The information is out there. I just hope these young kids that they get direction, you know, to to, to for for a teacher, for a parent, for somebody to say, sit them down and say, hey, here's the history. This is what you got to look at. You got to you got to know what a brush is if you're going to play this instrument, you know. Yeah. Um, and then discover all of the great brush players. You know of the past that that gave us all of these concepts and ideas and and um, and uh, I mean to answer the question yes and I use brushes all the time um, you know it's again this we have a whole brush course in my school um, yeah and I just so happen to have a pair of first brushes here so all right I'll take my uh, top layer of my trusty Pro Logic pad off here which gives me a brush surface. Of that man, yeah, this is this is uh Pro Logic's uh, this is Russ Miller's pad, and, okay, yeah, and uh, brilliant design, so that's really cool. I'm gonna be creating some stuff with uh, Pro Logic too here in a minute, but but yeah, um, you know, with brushes, obviously, these things are, are all about touch because you can't, you know, can't play into the head, you know, it's and there's no there's no rebound, so. You know, you've got to create all the stuff, singles and doubles, you know, with your hands. You know, and my my uh, recommendation is just to practice everything that you that you play with sticks, with the brushes, meaning rudiment, rudimentarily. So mm -hmm. singles, you know, and it's I'm really kind of pulling up with these guys. I'm not I'm not going into the head, you know. But obviously, with the brushes, you know, there's, you know, there's classic patterns that, um, let's see if I can get this right. Yeah. Classic patterns, you know, that you can go. A lot of, there's a lot of ways to do it, too. And I, I go counterclockwise with the left hand, right? A lot of a lot of ways to play them and a lot of things to do but um to answer the question yeah i mean and they're not only for jazz too you know you can play grooves just ask Steve that he's made a whole career out of playing brushes with uh, millions of people and 
plays them better than anybody, in my opinion, just about. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of great brush players out there. Adam Nussbaum's one of my favorite brush players. Yeah. Ed Sof, one of my favorite brush players. You know, Steve Smith, of course, has taken brushes to a new level. Um, um, God, there's so, there's so you many. You got guys like Clayton Cameron, who Clayton, just, that's who I was just thinking yeah, of. Like, taken, yeah, to an even yeah. other place. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of guys. I mean, the list is extensive. Jeff Hamilton, also one of my favorite brush players. Yeah. All these guys are, are tremendous, you know, great. And uh, and of course, going back, I used to hang out quite a bit with Ed, Ed Thigpen, who um, who was in Denmark, and uh, you know, in later years, and we we spent a lot of time together. And he's got a great book. And John Riley, I think, has a book. There's a lot of a lot of a lot of great uh, a lot of great brush players and books out there so yes brushes are still valid <laughs> learn them practice them create make music with them yeah uh, absolutely all right a uh, few more questions here that were sent in advance and i'm seeing lots more being posted here so so cool. we will try to get to them so sebastian corinth is asking um about feel and and he's saying playing on top i remember dave talking about that in the context of chicks trio playing backbeats slash laying back coming from a straight ahead background. So um, I guess yeah, he's maybe just asking you to talk about your feel and, you know, differences between playing on top of it and then maybe pulling, you know, maybe behind it or playing behind it. Well, you know, so, I mean, so much of these feel questions are, you, you can't really answer them uh, globally because in my opinion, it all depends on who you're playing with and how you're going to make the overall music feel and what the agreement is with the musicians that you're making the music. Um, you know, what, what, what kind of feel do you want the songs to have? Um, if we're talking about a click track or if we're talking about a track in general that you're playing to that's, you know, already... Um, done like i have a bunch of play along things obviously with this moises app you can take kind of take drums out for the most part and play with it but um with my stuff for the most part it's pretty it's pretty locked in all right and i make it locked in actually move some things around so that people are playing with a pretty on it uh, metronomic source with feel but not too much you know it's, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to have a practice tool that is doing this i mean it, you, you have to have something that you learn metronomic time in my opinion then you can mess with the feel mm -hmm. um but it's a it, like i said it it's hard to um to talk about you know playing on top or playing behind a click or a track because yeah, you can get a little bit of a feel thing going on if you're thinking a little more laid back. Um, but you got to be with the track. You don't want to be flamming either one side or the other, right? So, yeah. so to me, the question is more, you know, more um, applicable to playing with with musicians. And then I know for me, for example, uh, Oz Noy, right? one of a great guitar player, one of my favorite guys. To play with, um, Oz will have different bass players, and in that band, I've played with James Genus, Will Lee, Daryl Jones, um, uh, uh, Jimmy Haslip, other and other bass players, and all of the bass players feel different in that band. Mm -hmm. And I just remember playing with Daryl, especially, it was an education for me because I had to I had to learn how to lay back even more than. Yeah. Oz likes his stuff kind of felt in, you know, in a certain pocket that was different for me to grasp onto anyway, because my tendency is to like to be on top a little bit and admit it. It's, that's what I feels good to me. Yeah. Um, of course, not all the time, but, but I, I'm trying to create a feel that is genuinely mine that when I'm playing. So, um, you know, if we all had the same feel, it would be pretty boring. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I had to learn. Wow, I really had to learn that. And you know, the, the again in my school, there's a groove course, <laughs> and uh, what I talk about is, um, you know, I, I talk about this thing called time by motion, and and it's it's really about dictating where the time feel is 
just by thinking about your body's motion. Now, I use, I utilize something called a Muller technique quite a lot in my playing, both in, both in technical stuff, you know, and for accents, but I also use it in the groove. So when I'm playing a simple groove, like a, you know, this type of thing, you know, the motion is, is, is all molar. So, so if I'm playing, um, if I'm playing to, uh, if I'm playing to a click and, and the click is, is, is there, um, if I, if I play into that, all right, now that's fairly on it. If I want to lay it back, see that starts slowing down though, that's the problem. So you have to really be careful, but without the click, um, if I'm just playing, I know that with the band, if I want to, to have a more of a back feel, I'll increase the motion just a little bit from this to this. And it just gives the appearance a little bit of a back feeling. Yeah. Also, the sound that you make creates a back feeling. Can't do it really on this kit because of the silent heads, but on a real drum set, you know, with real heads, a lot of the times, um, if I want to, if I want to have a creative feel that's on the backside, and and the music calls for it too, I'll quickly detune one or two lugs at the top of the snare drum, and then I get a fat drum, then I'll turn this stick over and play with the butt side right in the middle of the drum, and that that takes up more room. It just sounds bigger, and I'll incorporate the motion thing. If I want it on top, I'm going to be playing mostly rim shots and the drum will, it probably won't be that, that loose. It'll be tighter. So you can create a lot of things with feel, um, you know, based on those kind of thoughts. But again, most of it is kind of the agreement of how you're, you're gelling with everybody else. And that's kind of a decision that needs to be made when you're playing and even talked about. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great information. Great tips too about detuning the snare a little bit too to get. Yeah, that's know, my favorite. I, yeah. I love doing that in the middle of a show, you know, from one song to another. <laughs> you know. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get that. You get that great sound all of a sudden. You know, it's, it's yeah. really cool. And then next song's a Latin tune, right? Where it's hey, we <laughs> so go. Yeah, no, but it works. It does work. Yeah. All right. Um, this is a question from Darren Dentremont, who's asking if you're still racing your Corvette. Took a little sidebar from for one second. Uh -huh. You know, not really. Um, there are certain things that, you know, at a certain age, I shouldn't say that because Paul Newman was racing into his 80s, I think. But um, but yeah, here here in St. Louis, I'm missing two things. First of all, I'm missing my mechanic, Donnie York, who used to take care of my car. So safety is primary first you know, everything when you're going fast. So I've got other people, but eh. and then the racetrack here, worldwide technology is is okay, but it's not as cool as the corn California track. So that's besides my daughter, that's the one thing that I really miss the most about California is is the racetracks and that whole thing. But it's okay. I'm I'm so busy right now building this recording studio and getting, you know, a bunch of projects going on that um yeah, priorities have shifted a little bit. I even had, I even had, I even have not had the simulator on in a few months. It's like, you know, <laughs> so now yeah. I'm probably going to turn the Corvette back to stock. And my wife says, don't sell it. I want to drive it. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's racing, good. Racing, uh, the racing career, I think, is, uh, yeah. is, is, is kind of over at this point. We'll see. Maybe yeah. I'll, maybe I'll want to get back into it later, but I kind of doubt it. Yeah. Maybe it's just on hold for a little while, like you said, until yeah. you get these other big things, you know, taken care yeah. of. So well, your shirt, your shirt is inspiring. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, next. All right, uh, another one from Anthony Cusina. Um, you know, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. ask John Berger's question, Anthony. I'll try to get to this at the end because there's a bunch more. 
um, that have been posted. So I want to try to get as many as we can. Here. Yeah, let's get to the live stuff. Yeah, yeah John Berger just asked this. Uh, when a, whenever a venue supplies wedge monitors with a house sound monitor, front of house mixer, the mix on stage is almost always muddy. How do you deal with that kind of situation in sound checks? Uh, and he said, I, I personally never use, never have drums in my monitors. So I guess he's asking, how do you deal with, um, well, I'm going to guess you never have to deal with a bad mix because you are the controller of the mix. Well, yeah, I'm my, I'm sitting here spinning going, geez, you know, <laughs> so this question all by itself could put the answer could take an hour. Um, yeah. It's too many, there's too many variables. Um, yeah, you're right, John. I, I stopped, um, uh, more or less dealing with, um, with monitors controlled by somebody else a long time ago uh, in most situations. Uh, sometimes I still do it, but it's, it's the only time that I'll do it is when there's minimal stuff happening and it's when I'm playing mostly acoustic and I'm not using in-ears um, and I'm not using my mixer for that, for that reason. Uh, but even then, what I tend to do even if, like I said, if I'm not using the in-ears, like my big band show that I just did last month, um, perfect example, I still use my mixer. And I had Dan Curry, the sound guy, I had wedges, right? I had two, two wedges. Um, but I had him send me uh, like a mix of the horns and I had bass and piano and guitar separate. I just took splits off those. And that's relatively easy to do if you show up with, if they have extra cables um, and maybe a DI box or two. But those, those things are kind of standard. I also carry my own Y cables. So, so for the guitar, for example, um, you know, if you have good Y cables that are not noisy, you, know, you just plug in the cable to the mic and then there's two ends. One goes to the house, one goes to me. That way... And my, and these are powered monitors. That's that's one thing that makes it easier because you can just take an output of the mixer, go straight to the monitors, and you know, then I have I still have control that I can EQ certain things. The drums in this situation, I had I didn't worry about it too much. I just put the bass drum in the overhead, you know, the center overhead, uh, and that was the drum mix. And I I don't even know if I had it on, maybe a little. Uh, just for a little beef, but I doubt it. Mm -hmm. So in those situations, that's how I do it. Uh, sometimes the last few gigs we were doing with Chick uh, back with the acoustic trio, and in fact, any acoustic trio that I would do, I just I just get the piano and a little bit of bass in there and the drums are not in at all. So somebody else can do that. And then, but but the mix being muddy, that is something that you need to spend some time learning about sound. You have to be able to talk to the engineer in his language. You can't just say, hey, man, it sounds like crap. Fix it. Right. That's not going to work. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so you got to know enough about EQ. And also, you got to actually have one of the monitor guys check and make sure that the speaker is not blown or something, that the tweeter is blown, not blown. Uh, if the speaker is in good working condition, you can, if you know enough about frequency, you know enough about the sound of things, you can say, hey, um, you know, the guitar is killing me at 3K, turn 3K down on the guitar, or just bring 3, 2 to 1, 1.5 to 3.5, bring that down, minus 5 dB, whatever, and that'll take the harshness out. Maybe they have high end rolled off to alleviate feedback, who knows. Um, there's, there's, it's, it's obviously another profession, it's part of your profession, but it's another part of it that, for me, was important enough to learn about it so that I could talk to these people in the first in the first place and and later kind of just take control of it myself um you, you do have to know what you're doing though you can't just buy a mixer plug a bunch of plug your drums in there and say here's my stereo mix you know so you've got to know what you're doing so um yeah. Yeah. so please don't do that but there's a lot of info out there there is a recording and a mixing course on my school i will just say that right now. all right no this is great man this is really yeah. important that people know that that's yeah, yeah. A, lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff there so at least for the stuff that i know and i've i spent my early career hanging around the best uh recording mixing engineers in new york um you know spent a bunch of time with dennis moody um and um yeah just a, a bunch of 
bunch of great engineers that I learned from and, and Jay Almer, he's the one that taught me everything basically um, in the beginning. So, uh, you know, I'm still learning. Good yeah. thing about it is it's free. Um, you get your room sounding good, you get your drums, you mix. Does it sound like this guy's record? No. Okay, what do I got to do? What's different? You just improve your ear, you know, that's, that's part of it. But study frequencies. Frequencies are pitches. A440, that, that number means that 440 hertz is the A on a piano. Half of that is 220, half of that is 110, the opposite way. So you learn, you learn about your frequencies about, you know, uh, you know, relative to notes and pitches so that you can start to identify problems. You know, even if it's relative, you can get close. And if there's a, something feeding back in your monitor, so you go, you know, it's like, hey, bass player, what's that note? And then you get the note. If it's an A, guess what? It's probably 220. So, which is probably close to what I was saying, actually. So, yeah. yeah. So there, it's it's another part of it that was interesting enough for me to learn about it, and um, and and now you know, mixing and recording is part of my job. It's part of I get paid to do it. Um, it's part of my my career. So you know, it's, a, it's I'll go back to saying that you know to just be a drummer, um, you know, good luck. Yeah. But it's it's. I enjoy a lot, a lot of other aspects in the business, not just the drums. So yeah, and this, adds one, value. this one is totally related to what we do. This is, you know, this is what we do. It's our yeah. sound, you know, so take some for responsibility for it, at least to learn about it, know about what, what your, what your drums sound like, how that relates to a microphone capture, where the mics are positioned, how that affects things. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's really enjoyable to learn about it. It's fascinating, actually. Well, I, I want to just add a quick sidebar to what you're saying. So everybody at, at, out there watching this, everybody at home, uh, a week or so ago at, at PASIC, where Dave was, where I was, um, during Keith Carlock's sound check, you were nice enough to talk to the engineer and tweak a few things with Keith's drum sound. And, uh, and it made a big difference. He had a great, his, I mean, it, you know, it really, and, and Keith said to me later, how glad he was that you were there. I believe it was Keith's clinic that, that where you yeah. did that. Yeah. Well, he was the first one that morning and, yeah, yeah. and we walked in to check it out and I, you know, I figured, okay, I'm going to sit, you know, dead center in front of Keith, 10 rows back and check out a sound check. And I spent 30 minutes, 35 minutes, probably just sitting there waiting to hear what it would sound like, you know? And, um, you know, the speakers, it was an array system, right? So they're big, you know, all these speakers up there and the subwoofers were like a house over here and over there. You know? So, uh, of course, you know, a lot of low end. And, um, but the, the thing is, is that Keith was playing the tracks. You know, he's playing the tracks and, and, and I'm sitting there and I don't hear the music at all. Like I kind of faintly hear it every once in a while up in the speaker up there. And again, I was waiting. And I'm noticing that the monitors on stage were all facing Keith. And they were in, at the front of the stage. And I'm like, well, why aren't there any front fills here? Now, this is a term that unless you're a sound engineer, you, you don't really know what front fills mean or, or how they're operated or why. But in a situation like this, it's common sense. It's like, look, we're in a room that holds 2,000 people. Okay. You got speakers way over there. Like we're talking 100 feet on each side of center. Mm. There's no way people in the center are going to hear what's going on except from the stage and kind of over there somewhere. So that's when I finally got up and I said, excuse me, I'm going to be playing here later today and I'm going to ask you to do this for me. So, but it would be nice to do it for everybody. You guys got to put front fills in so that we can hear. I said, walk with me, you know, and I brought the guy to the center and he's like, Oh, and then, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's like, it's not my job. You know? Um, <laughs> yeah, so so they did it. They actually turned all the speakers around and they got a mix going. And it's like, you know, I can enjoy this. I can actually yeah. sit here, hear the music, hear the track, hear the drums. And, you know, so a lot of it's common sense. It's like, man, if you got anyway. So I was happy to help Keith. That's, you know, not part of the discussion but but um but i think it just helped everybody to you know to do that but but the point is you can't rely on sound people to always um either uh remember have time uh know 
or care. And yeah. so got to help them, and, which means being nice, talking in their language, and suggesting things that, you know, based on my experience from guys that do know what they're doing, have the time, care, how it sounds good. And, and we do it that way. That's it. That's our method of operation. So. Great. Thanks, Dave. So okay. I'll, I'll jump to some of these questions now that have been posted. Yeah. And uh, Sean Falk is asking, um, how did you accomplish your independence? I guess, <clears throat> any suggestions on working on independence? Independence is one of those things that you just have to do it. Um, you have to practice it. Um, go through Gary Chester's New Breed One. Um, come up with your own independence exercises. Um, this is, you know, you can, you can practice this stuff away from the drums. You can tap, you know, and get independence things going. Um, I don't have a, an independence course per se yet in my school. I will have certain exercises having to do with foot technique and hand technique. I delve into it. There are exercises there that will help. Um, but one thing you can do right, right off the bat, is everything that you play when you practice, any fill especially, keep the hi-hat going, first in quarter notes, then in eighth notes. Because it's it's easy, it's easy to go around the drums and play, you know, or but to keep this To do all that with that is a whole other thing. It's a whole other element. So quick independence lesson, do that. That's great. Uh, that yeah. Gary Chester New Breed, and there's many others, many others, many others. Books, books. That's what books are for. Great. And just a comment from our friend Rich Stitzel, who says the new video for Do I Do is killing. And you. shout out to Rich. Yeah, we had we had so much fun. I yeah, you know, the the drum fantasy camp band, which is just a killer band. Um, you know, our longtime mates Chrissy Poland and Vinny uh, Valentino and Stu Miniman. You know, that's the core. And and Hagar Ben. Um, I always forget her name. I'm sorry, but uh, she's a great bass player. Um, yeah, we had a couple of girls from MI sitting in with us, uh, background vocals. It was just cool, man. It was so much fun. So yeah, we we uh, we said, man, we should put this out. It sounds sounds fun, sounds good. It's like you know, so I had fun just mixing it here in my office. But um, yeah, Great. it was a lot of fun. I love Stevie, man. Anything with Stevie, it's like oh it's man, yeah, a lot to play. always fun to play. Our our good friend Dave Stark. Oh, Dave. So hey, Dave. Dave. Nice. Yeah. yeah says, uh, can you talk about what you do to stay in shape off the drum kit, body and mind? Body and mind, yeah. Well, biggest thing for me is that I, about a month and a half ago now, I, not that I was drinking a lot, but I completely stopped drinking alcohol completely, like not a drop. And that has kind of, you know, like helped me a lot in a lot of areas. Um, my wife, Clivia, she's really into um, working out and um, pescatarian diet, meaning fish with veggies. And, you know, so we're, we're working together on, on a, a working out situation. My favorite thing to do right now are these Tabata workouts. Are you hip to these? These no. like 10 minute, six minute, five minute, 15 minute, 12 minute exercises with no gear. And, you know, you got these guys and gals on there that are just in incredible shape. And, you know, I'm doing this one dude now that's got, I've never seen a six pack like this guy. It's just like, it's like a 12 pack. You know? <laughs> and, um, yeah, it takes 15 minutes of my morning, you know, so, and I, I'm, I'm dying after. And then as my wife says, stretch, stretch, stretch after. So, so that's the physical part. I, I was walking quite a bit uh, when it was warm, but, uh, it's actually um, got 60 degrees today. I have to get out there nice. uh, here in St. Louis. Yeah. So, um, uh, so working out, activity, move, just you know, get things going. And, and I use a rubber band. I take it to the hotels all the time. Strap it around the doors. I'm always working. You know, just the small, the small tendons, muscles. You know, just to keep tight. Um, not interested in getting big. I don't care. But um, 
just, just keep the little guys strong, you know, just keep strong. Move. And then diet. Diet is everything, man. Whatever you put in, you know, that's, it's, it's, and it's hard because there's a lot of fun food to eat. <laughs> there's a lot of fun stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, it's like all those potato chips and, you know, hot spicy Fritos and, you know, it's, uh, it takes its toll. So, you know, we, um, I try to stay healthy. I eat, I eat green vegetables every day. It's uh, as much fruit as I can. So I just try to stay healthy. I want to be around for a while. I, mean, I don't want yeah. this to end earlier than it's supposed to. So um, I got I got a lot of playing left to do and a lot of living to do. So, um, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to stick around for it all. Yeah. Great. Yep. And you will. And uh, my, my pal Rich Farago has, this, has a good question, I think, here. Uh, Dave, you have an amazing, you have amazing accuracy when hitting kicks during a solo. Can you talk about your method of how you are able to sound like you're playing so free under the structure of odd kicks from the band? Yeah, good question, Rich. Um, you know, again, I address a lot of this in the school too, on in great detail, but, um, depending on the song, um, but a, a lot of it first is the understanding of rhythm in depth, like really understanding um, displacement rhythms, um, modulating rhythms, even just simple, you know, where the sixteenths and the triplets lie within the pulse to begin with. We're not even talking about odd groupings, you know, we're talking about just simple four and three, sixteenths, triplets. And, and then having the mathematical knowledge, which, um, you know, because a lot of it is all of its math, basically, but, um, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of, you know, groupings and polyrhythms and, and things that, that you need to practice. And again, I did a lot of this in my youth when I, when I was driving home from Connecticut to St. Louis, I was singing to tapes, you know, you know, the groove would be happening, you know, you know the groove is happening and I'm singing, you know, you know, you know, knowing, you know, where the song helped me outline the time. Um, you know, again, uh, threes against fours are some of the, my, one of my favorite things to do um, in reverse. So uh, knowledge, rhythm knowledge uh, first, and then it becomes the precision. So I, this is one thing that I enforce a lot with students, um, whether I'm teaching here, this, like I said, my little teaching setup until I get going down there um, soon, hopefully. But when I'm talking to people, it's about the precision of what you're, what you're playing and singing. You have to be able to have the independence, this is independence too, of singing precisely. But where, where are all of those falling? So that when it comes time to and then you know, like I said, the body motion and all the natural stuff kind of kind of works into all of this because if I'm stiff and I'm trying to go, bop, bop, you know, and I'm playing like that, it's like forget about it, you know. Yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to keep all of this flow. I mean, as Vinnie Caliuta said once said. Most people have no idea how much it takes, you know. I remember <laughs> in one thing Vinny said, especially for Vinny, that's true, you know. It's like yeah, uh, yeah. I've never seen anybody have more precision and stuff going on than that guy. It's incredible. But um, but um, it takes it just takes a lot. It takes you know kind of complete complete involvement, um, you know, with um, music, you know, absorb absorb listen you know yeah certain song with hits you got to sing it first if you can sing a drum solo and fills over the hits you're gonna have a better chance of playing it but if you don't do that work it's gonna be pretty hard because you're just gonna you're not mentally learning it you're not really mentally learning it yeah yeah that's that's really great advice yeah it's like you you're you're more apt to you know develop that muscle memory if you can sing it and have it and really have it be kind of innate in your DNA to be able to play over it. 
Well, more, more importantly, though, it develops spontaneous mind spontan spontaneity. It's it's uh, you know and memory. It's it because yeah. a lot of what I do, um, I like to live in a spontaneous world here. Um, everything else I do is pretty planned out, but but here I like to live dangerously. I like to not really pre-plan a lot of stuff. So it needs to be um, you know in that moment um, dictated by what I'm what I'm hearing what I'm feeling what I want to say in that moment not something that I practiced yesterday that's like oh I'm showing up and it's like okay I'm gonna do that Phil now <laughs> that's the worst don't do that please uh, <laughs> yeah so um, yeah so one of the in the soloing course in my school one of the things that I talk about quite a bit is um, is is soloing you know concepts and rules and things that I put on myself and, you know, uh, to do. But again, none of that can happen until the, until the understanding of the rhythm and the precision and the math and the independence come together of being able to sing those hits, sing those rhythms, sing your drum stuff that you want to play all against time. And you can practice this with music playing, with a click, whatever you want, but practice your singing. It's like, do it again. Gotta, gotta be here before it's here. So it's not really muscle memory first. It's up here yeah. first. Yep. And here. Yep. No. Good. Good clarification. Um, thank you for that. My pal Dan Peterson has a has a great question here, um, asking if we can squeeze this in. Curious who Dave aspires to at this point in his life, and his career. Where does he? where he draws his inspiration to move to the next level. Is there one? Uh, well, you know, I'm not so concerned with next levels. I mean, at this stage, I'm concerned with current levels staying possible. <laughs> you can roll it, Johnny. Come on, man. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there's always something new to learn, always something inspiring. I mean, there's so many great young, young-ish players out there now that's... Uh, you know, there, this, the list is is very long. There's a lot of a lot of great guys. So I, you know, honestly, I don't look to anyone in particular. Um, my inspirations are pulled from many sources, um, and um, and the, like I said, for me, the most important thing at this stage of my life, my career, is staying healthy, maintaining um, maintaining my my mental and physical ability on the kit, um, and uh, you know, my, right now, the biggest thing that I'm dying to get back to doing is creating music. Um, I'm just about ready to move into my studio downstairs. Uh, and when that happens, it's I'm really looking forward to um, getting back into writing mode, creating mode, um, recording groups here and doing doing stuff. So that's a that's a big one for me. I just I just want to get back that inspiration that I haven't sort of haven't been in that chair for a while. So. I'm looking forward to that. Great. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more questions here as we we've rounded the uh, one hour mark here. And this is from Rodney Milliken, who Rodney, sorry to hear you have tendonitis. He says, "I have tendonitis." I don't have. I don't have tendonitis. No, I I wouldn't think sorry so. Sorry you do, Rodney, but I don't have tendonitis. Mine is arthritic and bone spurs, and I just don't I just don't have any cartilage left, you know, after fifty six yeah. or whatever years of doing this. But yeah, go ahead. So. Well, he, no, that's okay, Dave. And his question was, has that ever happened to you? And if so, how did you deal with it? But yeah, uh, it sounds like well, it's a constant. It. It's a constant dealing with. Um, you know, it's. Uh, uh, I will say, I will say, cutting out red meat and chicken six or seven years ago, whatever it was, uh, really helped uh, the inflammation. The key is to keep inflammation down. So staying away from sugar, staying away from in inflammatory foods um, is, uh, is, is, is a big part of it. Um, I know for me becoming a not strict vegetarian because I eat fish a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but that's the only meat protein I eat and uh, for a long time. And I know it was almost immediate that you know, the system works better, the body works better, and the inflammation went down. Um, wow. yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's just, the diet thing is tough, man. It's really tough to make a decision to change because we're so used to doing something. We're so ingrained, you know, that we're, we're doing it. But 
I'm trying to discover new, you know, uh, all protein alternatives all the time. And, um, and just to get into the frame of mind that it, it's different than what we did growing up, you know? Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's a big one. Um, and, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I've honestly, I got this hand, you know, I, I slam like an idiot. I slam this door in a van myself. Like I closed the door on my own thumb. <laughs> that's how stupid that was. That was like three years ago. And, um, and I didn't, you know, I got, I had an x-ray immediately and it didn't break anything, but you know, your, your immediate reaction to doing something like that is to pull Well, the door was closed and I'm pulling and it's like, <sighs> um, yeah, so I kind of messed it up. And, um, so injury has, has become a little bit worse since then. But, um, but the good, the good news is, is that playing is the least, you know, that it's because of the approach and, and that I'm not pinching up here. See, if I do that, that really hurts here. But, but if I'm back here playing, I don't feel anything up here. So it's, it's actually great. Um, but you know, I, I had it checked out and the doctor said, well, you got two choices. I can pretty much fix it with a surgery or I could give you a cortisone shot. And he said, might last a few months and we could do that a few times. You know, he said, based on what are you seeing that that wouldn't harm me too much. I don't like to get anything shot in my body, but I opted for that and uh, it lasted a couple months. Now it hurts like hell again. So, um, you know, I'm, uh, we'll see, we'll see what happens. And I've been able to maintain it. You know, I don't, I don't take a lot of drugs at all it's like you know tylenol arthritis when i have to play and it really hurts sometimes i do but other than that i just kind of deal with it i mean my biggest problem is i'm still stupid enough to be doing other stuff like downstairs i'm sanding and painting and staining and doing <laughs> crap that i shouldn't be doing yeah. um but i want to get my room done there ain't nobody else around so it's like, <laughs> hey i'm doing this you know just take part in it but um but yeah it's a, it's a constant struggle but but try to avoid um doing things you shouldn't be doing um, that fatigue it, that hurt it. I'll tell you, the worst one is drilling. <laughs> like yeah. doing anything where you're gripping and you have you know a lot of force against it, that I've stopped doing on, on any levels of really you know uh, hard stuff. But, but yeah, we just try to do the best we can. Like I said, luckily for me, it's not really affecting my playing yet. Yeah. So wow yeah sorry to hear about that but um the age game, man. <laughs> yeah all right I, I promise just a couple more here dave yeah, right. um mike cassano is asking uh are, are there any new 40th uh, dave 40th anniversary signature snare drum models coming out in 2023 or any new 40th anniversary model coming out in 2023 that's your 40th year with with yamaha yeah, next next year will be the 40th year with yamaha uh, wow. Yeah. yeah wow is exactly congratulations right. man yeah um we we are in talks yamaha and i are in talks about some things um at the moment you know COVID has kind of you know the, the reciprocal um things that you know the, just supply chain and you know how things are being done it's uh, we're still all feeling it in every part of the world that we that we have to deal with so supplies where drums and you know that type of thing is concerned are still suffering so the one idea that i really want to have done it can't be done next year so um it might be a year late and i can't talk about it yet because we're still developing it but uh, as of right now uh, the answer to the question is no there won't be anything next year being released i don't believe okay but stay tuned perfect yeah, stay tuned. Stay tuned. And it makes perfect sense, given that, you know, like you said, companies are still trying to recover from, you know, almost three years of just everything being upside down. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, I just realized you got a right handed set set up back there. I do. That's for when you come over and visit. Oh, I see. It's, it's all set for you. I got it ready for you. I see. I was going to say, wow, it looks like a mirrored image. And then I was like, Wait a minute, that is right handed. Okay. You know, it's weird day. I not to I take a quick sidetrack from, from your show, but when I look at a left-handed drum set, even being left-handed myself, it looks strange to me. It really does. I, you know, I look at it, I go, God, that looks so weird. Yeah. <laughs> I can't play well, it any other way, but it's just looks weird. Well, we don't, we don't see it that much. That's why it's strange looking, but um, you know, yeah, don't have a, don't have a thing on that, man. Just, just it's all good. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
By the way, Rob Wallace is watching. He says, great work, fellas. Thanks, Rob. Have, have a call with Rob. Jeremy Stacy is watching. Great, Jeremy awesome. Stacy, man. Great. And uh, there was one other question I wanted to read that I think, uh, let's see, let's see. I, boy, they scroll by and then I can't find them again. Let's see. Someone had asked if there is any updates on a chick CD that you were working on. Let's see. Where did that go? Yeah, no, that's, I can pretty much tell you what that's okay. about. Um, yeah, I mean, the answer is that it's, I understand that there's something close to happening in a release. Um, you know, Chick Corea Productions uh, has carried on, of course, and they are, they are working to try to satisfy Chick's uh, wishes. And um, as soon as that happens, the record, because it's been in the can for a year, so it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's ready to go, and uh, we're hoping soon. And um, just stay tuned. That's I'll be blasting. Certainly, we'll all be blasting about it when it gets released. So, but uh, we're hoping soon. Great. Thanks for reminding me. I'm going to call them again and check. <laughs> Perfect. Good. Well, Dave, this has been so great. I, I apologize. I think I got to pretty much all the questions, or almost every single one. And right. I do appreciate, yeah, everybody asking all these questions. But mostly, I want to thank Dave Weckel for being here to do this today, and and. Uh, generously giving us so much of your time today to answer these questions, Dave. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, I felt bad we didn't get to answer one question the last time we just talked. So it was nice to nice to be able to see. Well, hopefully everybody sees us and you know. Yeah. And thanks for being there, guys. Folks. Yeah, well, the yeah. last one was monumental. I mean, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for a, a better one hundredth episode than having the man on there. So thank you. So this is great. We covered all the bases between that and this. So cool. Yeah. All right. Man. Well, like I said, boom. one last sales pitch for me. Just don't forget. Yes. About yeah. Please tool. talk about the website, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah just my website. Uh, DaveWeckel.com is where you find everything out about what's going on with me. And, um, you know, the school sign up is there. I'm teaching privately. You can sign up for that too there. So I uh, got some time off now. So I'm back into teaching a little bit and, um, yeah, it's all under the learn tab. I think there's a tab up there that says learn. So it's uh, just read up, read up, read away and follow the instructions and uh, come on in whichever way yeah, you everybody. want. Yeah. Go to daveweckel.com. Really. I mean, for, for $30, I mean, $30 a month, basically it's, I mean, it's a no brainer as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to sign that's up. Correct. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on in, Johnny. Yeah. Oh, besides the school, you know, the one thing to say about it, that for those that don't know, because I know Mike Cassano is a, is a student, and, and, uh, um, but you know we have a private Facebook forum. So when you become part of the school, Steve Ork and my partner will allow you in there, and I'm in there all the time. I'm answering questions and look, looking at videos. You know, where it's a it's a real cool community. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Little added bonus. Yep. Little added bonus. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for watching. A big hand for Dave Weckl. Um, yeah, Dave. I, and uh, you might want to change your number because I'm probably going to contact you again to do something next year. So <laughs> you've been warned. Anytime, Johnny. It's always an honor, man. Glad, uh, honored to be on your 100th. And, uh, you know, this was fun. Anytime. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Be, be well, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving if you're celebrating. And, uh, you know, have a good one. Yeah.